Welcome back to Face the Nation. With us now is former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Mayor, I want to ask you about something former Speaker Newt Gingrich said, uh, which is that he said white Americans can't understand the extra risk that comes with being black in America and that whites instinctively underestimate the danger of the black experience. What do you think about that? I agree with that completely. I, I agree uh, largely with the sentiments of uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings. Uh, the, the reality is we have to look differently at race in America if we're going to change this. We've been looking at it the same way for 20 years and, and here's where we are. And uh, we both have to try to understand each other. For, first, let me say my deep sympathy for the people of Minnesota, people of Louisiana, people of Texas and of Dallas. And I'd, I'd like them all to remember that although these incidents happen in different ways, they all share it together as Americans. We, uh, we, we share this violence together as Americans. So, so maybe whites have to look at it differently and blacks have to look at it differently. Whites have to realize that African-American men have a fear and boys have a fear of being confronted by the police because of some of these incidents. Some people may consider it rational. Some people may consider it irrational, but it's a reality. It, it exists. And there's a second reality in the, in the black community. And the second reality in the black community is there's too much violence in the black community. So a black will die 1% or less at the hands of the police and 99% at the hands of a civilian, most often another black. So if you want to protect black lives, then you've got to protect black lives, not just against police, which happens rarely, although with tremendous attention, and which happens every 14 hours in Chicago, every 14 hours hours and we never hear from black lives matter well, so it, so if you want to deal if you want to deal with this on the black side you've got to teach your children to be respectful to the police and you've got to teach your children that the real danger to them is not the police the real danger to them 99 out of 100 times 9900 out of a thousand times are other black kids who are going to kill them that's the way they're going to die so mr mayor now, on the, on, the white, on, on the white side, we have to understand that whether we get it or not, there is this extraordinary fear of the police, and the police have to, be, have to institute a policy of zero tolerance, like we did for crime in New York. Zero tolerance. No disrespect. Uh, way back uh, 14 years ago, Commissioner Howard Safer began a program in New York City called Courtesy, Professionalism, and Respect. It was, con continued, by, it was continued by the next three police commissioners, including so, the one you just had on now. Mr. Mr. Mayor, let me just ask you, you start off by saying that, that uh, white Americans have to understand that this is happening in the black community, and then at the end, it's, you said members of the black community have to teach their children to behave in, in, in front of the police. That, that those messages seem to conflict with one another. Of course, they, of course they don't. If I were a black father and I was concerned about the safety of my child, really concerned about it and not in a politically activist sense i would say be very respectful to police most of them are good some can be very bad and just be very careful and so what a police i'd also say be very careful of those kids in the neighborhood and don't get involved with them because son there's a 99 percent chance they're going to kill you not the police and we got to hear that from the black community and what we got to hear from the black community is how and what they are doing among themselves about the crime problem in the black community. When, when, you know, when there are 60 shootings in Chicago over the 4th of July and 14 murders and Black Lives Matter is non-existent, and then there's one police murder of very questionable circumstances, so, and we hear from Black Lives Matter, we wonder, do Black Lives Matter or only the very few black lives that are killed by white policemen, but not Mr. all Man those black lives that are killed by other blacks. You, and and on, the, on the black side, what they hear from us is constantly defending the police. Now, I'll give you an example. I had a police officer who brutally attacked a gentleman named Amadou Diallo. That police officer is now sitting in jail for 25 years due to the work of my police commissioner, Howard Safer, and the prosecution of now Attorney General Loretta Lynch. I also had police officers who were wrongly accused and acquitted by a jury, even though mobs were calling for them to be put in jail 
despite the fact that a jury found them not guilty. So Mr. these are complicated situations and we have to try to understand each other. Right. The, just a final question, sir. You said that the Black Lives Matter movement has put a target on the back of police officers. When members of the African-American community see videos as they have this week, they feel like there is a target on, on young black men. Uh, explain uh, your response about how they put a target on, on police officers, how that can match up when people see these videos. Well, when they talk about uh, uh, killing police officers. But they don't. And when they sing, oh, well, but, they sure do. They sing but, rap songs about killing police officers and they talk about uh, killing police officers and they yell it out at their rallies and but, the police officers Mr. Hear Mayor, it. but Mr. Mayor, what, what and you the seem reality to be doing is, is taking. Oh, please, please let me finish. And when, and when you say Black Lives Matter, that's inherently racist. Well, I think there are. Black argument, Lives we, Matter, White Lives Matter. Asian lives matter, Hispanic lives matter. That's anti-American and it's racist. Well, of course black lives matter and they matter greatly. But when you focus in on 1% of less than 1% of the murder that's going on in America and you make it a national thing and all of you in the media make it much bigger than the black kid who's getting killed in Chicago every 14 hours, you create a disproportion. The All police right. understand it, and it puts a target on their back. Every cop in America will tell you that if you ask them. All right, Mayor Giuliani, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Joining us now for more discussion on blacks and policing, Sherilyn Eiffel, head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Terrence Cunningham, president of the International Association of the Chiefs of Police, we also welcome Wesley Lowry of the Washington Post to the broadcast and thank him for coming in at the last minute when DeRay McKeeson was arrested. And finally, our Justice and Homeland Security correspondent Jeff Pegues, who is not only covering the story for us, but is working on a book due out next year called Black and Blue, Aggressive Policing, Racial Tension, and the Crisis in American Law Enforcement. Uh, Chief Cunningham, I want to pick up where we left off with Rudy Giuliani. Do, does every police officer feel like they have a target on their back? Well, John, what I think I would say is that um, today this is probably the most, arguably the most dif difficult time in American history to be a police officer. A um, couple of points. First of all, I mean, the, the police officers that are out there on the street today, they're worried about um, active shooters, they're worried about HVEs, um, they're clearly worried about the racial tensions that we see, and, and y the, the tensions are clearly palpable. Um, but I think that the, the, the point that's lost on a lot of people is the breakdown that we have in a lot of the social sy systems um, from mental illness, uh, untreated substance abuse, homelessness, joblessness, all gets laid at the feet of the, those police officers. So the officer out there today has to deal with those issues, and, th and then they still have to do their day job, which is responding to calls for service, particularly in the inner city, then with gang violence, the, the rise in violent crime. Um, and I do think that, that um, as, as Commissioner Bratton said, it's a very difficult time to be a police officer, and, th and the mere fact that you're out there in uniform, I do think that there's a target on those officers' backs. Just to get clarity here, you're, uh, you named a number of things which are large societal, cultural mm -hmm. things, and, and what, when you talk about being a target, it seems different than what Rudy Giuliani which was saying, which was that Black Lives Matter has put a target on those police officers. I, I, I wouldn't make that connection. I wouldn't say that it's Black Lives Matter that put a target on those police officers. I think that some of the rhetoric that, that, that we're hearing out there, um, and, and unfortunately, I think you know, people have really polarized this issue. If we really want to work towards solutions, we need to work together. Um, the, the IACP has been working a, a lot with the federal government. We've worked a lot with the White House. Um, this isn't new to us. We've been working on this for a long time. I think that we, we stood up a, an institute for community police relations. Um, in the uh, fall of 2014, we had a, a summit on uh, police relations. We had all the um, civil rights folks there. We had the NAACP, the ACLU. We had members of the community there. We had members of um, you know, policing from around the country there um, to discuss those issues. And then we published a, actually a, a summit report that, that came out of that. So we're continuing to try and do that. And I think just about every person that you, you've heard on your show today, John, they talk about police training. I think that's what IACP has done. We've tried to support that, whether it's, whether it's fair and impartial policing. Um, I mean, it, it's yeah, that that's your know, policing in a democratic society. I mean, that's what we're, we've tried to further. Sharon Apple, your response to Mayor Giuliani before. Well, I, I hesitate to make my response all to Mayor Giuliani because, you know, part of what we're really confronted with today is the needs of 21st century policing and law enforcement. And Mayor Giuliani um, not only has a 20th century vision, but he actually presided over one of the most discredited areas 
uh, and periods of policing in the city of New York, and, which is in fact responsible for a lot of the tension that exists between police officers uh, and people in African American communities. The reason it's so difficult, the reason it's so difficult for young African American men, for all of us sitting here today, for police officers, is because of what has been revealed in the last two years. But what has been revealed in the last two years has been the reality in African American communities for decades. It's very convenient to talk about Black Lives Matter because people now know those three buzzwords. I lead an organization that has been at this for 75 years. And uh, the pre my predecessor, you know, who founded the organization, Thurgood Marshall, dealt with the issue of uh, violence uh, of police officers against young African Americans. So this has now been revealed to the American public largely because of cell phone videos that have allowed people to actually see what's happened. And now we're in this period of tremendous tension when something has been revealed that was formerly concealed. What can we do about it? Well, now we can't pretend that there's some golden age of trust between African Americans and police that we want to return to. If we're honest with ourselves, we're getting ready to do a new thing. We're creating a policing that never existed before. We're trying to create relationships that never existed before. We're trying to create trust where it never existed before. And what's required to do that is to take a fresh look at what it means to be a law enforcement officer in the 21st century. It means being able to open up communication to communities of color, not to lecture them about how they talk to their kids. Mm -hmm. Parents of African American men and boys are scared to death of their children's encounter with police and encounters with criminality. That happens every day. From every church pulpit, every Sunday, that's what's talked about. In community meetings, that's what's talked about. So when I hear this stuff about, you know, black on black crime and uh, that I heard Mayor Giuliani saying, come into our community, something he has never been quite good at doing, to be perfectly honest, be in our churches, listen to our conversations, attend our rallies when we talk about peace in our own communities. Wesley, let me ask you about uh, uh, DeRay. You've been in touch with his uh, with, with those his friends. Give us an update on what's happening. Of course, so DeRay McKesson, uh, the uh, activist who's you know broadly linked to the protest movement, who's still in custody in Baton Rouge, where he'd been uh, protesting and demonstrating in solidarity. Um, as of a few moments ago, he's still in custody. There are rumors that perhaps he may be released by noon or by one, but that had been 3 a.m., that had been 4 a.m., and that had been 7 a.m., and so who knows what will happen at noon. You know, what we know from watching the video um, of the, his arrest as well as some of the context was that him and a group of other activists were walking up the side of a, essentially a highway um, on the shoulder, um, and officers were saying, don't cross in the street, don't cross in the street. Based on the videos we've seen, it does not appear that he or anyone else had, had crossed into the street, but kind of suddenly he was taken into custody by officers who arrested him. That's not unlike, you know, someone who's been on the ground covering many demonstrations in many cities. That's not something that, that is not unique necessarily. I've seen people picked up on the street that way many times, activists and, and otherwise. Um, Chief, let me ask you a question just about this. You're not here to defend the Baton Rouge sure. Police Department, of course, but give us a sense from your perspective how these things play out, because one of the things in talking to activists and police is that they have to find a way to accommodate these kinds of protests. They seem to be doing that in Dallas before shots rang out. Is there a new model for how to handle these high tension moments uh, where you have a situation like what happened last night? Now, for, first, I, I think I would say that uh, as, as long as any demonstration is peaceful, the police are going to be there to support that demonstration. When, the, when, when it turns from a peaceful demonstration to um, a riotous type of behavior or uh, you know, a behavior where the crowd gets out of control, the, and then they have to change their tactics. But I think that I would point, John, as you said, right back to the Dallas Police Department. I think the Dallas Police Department did an incredible job. That, that night when they were there, they were protecting those, those, those demonstrators and those protesters first First Amendment right to assemble and to, and to free speech. People talk about this guardian versus warrior, you know, role. I think that was a co complete guardian uh, role that they were in that evening. And then when you watch as those shots started to ring out and those officers started to drop, you saw officers running towards the gunfire to protect those protests. They had no idea they were the ones being targeted, the police were being targeted. And then you saw other officers actually putting themselves between the, the bullets and the protesters. They, they were human shields to protect those people. And I think that, that it, that can't be lost on us. I mean, that was a perfect example. And it didn't matter. I saw white officers, I saw black officers, Hispanic officers, f males, females. It didn't matter who they were or what they were. They were there to protect those protesters. And I think that's what's important for people to know across this nation. All right, we're going to pause right there. Jeff, I'm going to start with you when we come back about what solutions may be happening, who's doing it right, and how much more we have to do. But for the moment, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. And we're back with more of our panel. Jeff, I want to, you've been out in the street, you've been reporting this story over time. 
What's the state of things, and are, are there places where the relationships are getting better between the community and police? Well, I think there are, are places, big cities, small cities, where relationships are improving. There has been an effort since Ferguson to increase community policing, increase the diversity of the police force. Um, but there are still problems that remain. You know, John, we're coming up on two years from Ferguson. and. Based on what I've seen going out into Chicago, and I was in Chicago without a camera, just an iPhone, recording what people are saying, uh, interviewing people there over the Memorial Day weekend, knowing that that would probably be a tough weekend for Chicagoans. And what I found is the underlying problem is still there. There remains this lack of trust. And and I don't know if, if, if you increase community policing, that's not going to address the problem. And why that's why we just, are where we are today. Why isn't it going to address the problem? Because everybody, you hear them just say community policing, it's like body cameras, it's a word that gets thrown out and we don't really, so get, tell us why it's not working. Well, we heard what Mayor Giuliani said. And I think that if you, if you talk to people in the communities and certainly if they hear what he just said, um, you know, as the mayor of Dallas said a couple of days ago, words matter. And I think uh, based on what he was saying about black families, it shows that he has, uh, and, I, and I'm sure uh, some of the interviews, uh, if he were to go and talk to some of the people there, it just shows a lack of understanding what the root of the problem is. There is a history of mistrust between the black community and law enforcement, and that's at the root here. And two years out from Ferguson, that still has not been addressed. And so you're not going to get to the root of the problem until you address that issue and, and until people like Rudy Giuliani uh, go to these communities, actually talk to the people who live there, and get a sense for what they really feel right. and what's really at the root of which, the problem. Which seemed to be what Newt Gingrich was, was saying in, in his quote. Wesley, you, you wrote about the Dallas Police Department. Of, of course. I've written about the Dallas Police Department in a, in a piece in today's Washington Post about the, F, the reform efforts there. Yeah, why was it working in Dallas? Well, and working is still relative, right? We're talking okay. about a relatively low bar uh, because what we know is that no police department has this perfectly and that we're still working to overcome a long history of these issues, right? But what had changed in part in Dallas was that things had been so bad. Dallas in the late in the 70s and 80s was known as one of the worst departments in the country as it related to these shootings. Some very horrific uh, shootings and killings that had happened in response there had been some attacks at police officers as well. Um, and over time, you had both the election of black local officials who started to come in, whether that be at the, in the mayor's office, eventually who placed some black police chiefs in, including the current chief, uh, district attorneys, judges. Um, but then you also saw a shift in some of the ethos um, requiring some level of accountability if and when an officer uh, commits a crime, or, or if and when an officer is involved in, the, in a shooting. But one other thing I want to say is that, you know, so I work on a team for the Washington Post that covers fatal police shootings full time, right? We've been studying this for two years. And I think that one of the, our inability to move forward with this conversation is largely based on our inability to grasp the facts of this. We often talk in rhetoric on, on either side, but we don't grasp the facts, right? For example, when Mayor Giuliani says that black men are almost never killed by police, it doesn't happen. Well, that's just not true. So what we know is the Washington Post data says that there have been 512 people who have been shot and killed by the police this year, in 2016. 123 of them have been black. That is a dead black person almost every single day this year. What we also know is, while we love and respect our police officers and we don't want any of them to be killed, that they are not that often killed in the line of duty. They are killed once, once a week an officer is killed, um, which is a tragedy, once a week. Three times a day, a police officer takes the life of an American citizen. And when we start to have this conversation about black-on-black -black crime or murder, we conflate two things right. because a criminal killing someone is not the same as the state, the government, a police officer killing someone. One of the reasons, John, that it, there's still the mistrust um, is because I think what the community is waiting for is two things. Number one, they understand that the rule of law applies to them. They break the law, they're going to be arrested. When, when there's that black-on-black -black crime, if they catch the so-called black-on-black crime and they catch the perpetrator, that perpetrator is going to be prosecuted and going to go to jail. What they want to know is that when a police officer takes a life uh, in a way that is unlawful, that that police officer will also face accountability and face the rule of law. And I think too often uh, what we have seen is, I mean, right now we're in Baltimore in the middle of these trials. Some, somebody's responsible for breaking the spine and the voice box of Freddie Gray, who was in that vi van. And thus far, no one has been held responsible. So one piece is accountability. The second piece is ownership of the problem. And ownership of the problem cannot simply fall on African Americans. It's interesting that, you know, we were listening to Mayor Ru Ru Rudy Giuliani because he's one of the people who, no matter what police officer, police officers did, 
um, always defended them. We see this with the spokespersons for police unions. Um, we need but that when something goes wrong, we want to hear from police officers. We take responsibility for the fact that something went wrong, that one of our people did something wrong so that we can come together and talk. In the same way, we're asked to take responsibility when people in our community uh, commit crimes. Chief Cunningham, the Burlington uh, police chief said one of a, the worries cops have is no cop can, tr can control what another cop does, but all cops will be judged by what the other cop does. Does this, uh, when we see what happened in Louisiana and in Minnesota, talk a little bit about what that does to just normal old police work for, for cops who are just trying to do their job? So, so first I would ask that, that people not rush to judgment on those two incidents because we haven't seen the full investigation yet. And unfortunately those videotapes that we see are just a snippet and, and, a, and a snapshot in time. So I'd wait for the investigation to come out. Um, I do think that this is a very difficult uh, thing for the police to deal with. Um, I, I would like to, John, just for one second, go back uh, and talk about uh, the collection of data in police shooting because I think that's really important. First of all, I think it's an embarrassment to our profession that, that we, we have to rely on the media to collect that data. Um, the IACP, with all of our partners and stakeholders, have been working with the FBI to come up to develop a platform so that we can capture that data. That is our data. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We should be able to look at it. We should be able to aggregate it, um, take a deep cut into it and to see what it means, whether or not we need to change our training, whether or not we need to um, you know, adapt our technologies and our equipment, whatever it may be. But it's an embarrassment that we don't have that data ourselves to, to deal with. Um, and, and I do think that you know, with, with, with these, the shootings that we see out there, we need to hold our officers accountable. There's absolutely no question about it. And, and I, I think that we shall have just said, hey, you know, police administrators need to say, you know what, there, there are bad cops. I'm not, I'm not talking about Louisiana and, and Minnesota because I'm, I don't want to rush to judgment there yet, but there are bad cops. And police administrators need to hold those people accountable. All right, Chief Cunningham, thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you. And we'll be right back. After the debate and conversation about the vital issues at the heart of this week of violence in America, we bring our attention back to the seven lives lost and the families and communities that will never be the same again. That's it for us today. Thanks for watching. Until next week, where we'll be broadcasting from the floor of the Quicken Loans Arena in Cleveland, host of this year's Republican National Convention. For Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.